question is actually gameful thinking and teaching to inspire learning. And let's please give them a nice warm welcome. Thank you. So welcome everybody. Thank you for coming. Thanks for sacrificing the other great sessions that are going on right now. Uh, in this session, we'll talk about how to get students excited about learning. And if you think about this, the courses that we have today, the classes, they all come from Industrial Revolution time, when we needed to train managers who would then oversee factories. And so today we want to teach people creativity and we want to get them started on lifelong learning. And so we have to use different tools. Uh, the sitting position in the classroom is like the worst one for learning because the big muscles in your body, they, they get squished. <coughs> Now, well, I'll tell you about the muscles in your body that uh, get squished when you sit down into the blood from your head rushes down to help. And that's when you fall asleep during class. So, so the positions that we have right from the beginning are really difficult for students. Uh, so uh, my name is, is Simon Mahayevsky and I uh, uh, enjoy teaching in introductory courses. And I'll show you today how you can use uh, gainful thinking to start in any type of a course. You see, advanced classes have an advantage, and that is, by the time uh, students got to that point, they already got filtered. It's not that students in advanced courses are somehow more motivated, but basically we've already filtered down everybody else that for some reason did not have uh, enough motivation to continue. So really, the best place for gamification is in those large introductory courses where students read the textbook, they learn how to hate the material, and then they leave. Uh, earlier, we had a presentation on gamification, uh, serious gaming in uh, medicine. And so what a beautiful way to uh, use video games to help doctors you know, kill a few virtual patients first you know, before they start on, on the real ones. But here's the difficulty with video games. Uh, you have to know software like Maya, software uh, that's advanced uh, for video uh, building. So you have to have a degree almost in video gaming before you can get started uh, you as the instructor on building infrastructure. So today I'll give you a few ideas on what you can do without those additional uh, computer skills. But let's get started though by using uh, a poll and I'd like you to navigate to the URL that you see above. It's pollev.com slash smpro. If you have a phone or a computer or a toaster, whatever you brought with you, you go ahead and pull it out and to go to paulev.com slash smpro and I would like you to tell me what is uh, your discipline. So if you're from computer science, from medicine, um, maybe you're a student, you go ahead and, and say that, but it's going to give us an idea of uh, uh, the background um, in, in the room. So let's take a moment to do that. We are using Poll Everywhere to do this with, and Poll Everywhere is a good example of uh, peer instruction. And I will make uh, a connection here between gamification and peer instruction in that when students in the classroom are using their devices, it's like you're putting a game controller in their hands. And we'll go into some theories why it is so important to provide this personalization in the classroom. Okay, so we have, uh, we have a gamer in the audience. Excellent. We have a few people that uh, uh, do design. As you, as you can see, the uh, concepts that are repeated, they get larger. So that's how uh, in the classroom we can... Uh, uh, quickly create a word cloud that helps us to see who's in the room. All right, so as these come up, uh, we can see that uh, really there's interest in motivating students in all areas of the university. Let me start here by talking about learning in, in general, in fact, across species. Uh, how many of you have pets? Raise your hand. We're going to do you the all peer instruction. Okay, very good. A lot of you have pets. You might have noticed that most animals um, play. I'm going to uh, uh, show you this uh, Google image search. This is called the playful bow. And so animals this way signal that they are learned, that they're ready for play. And uh, different animals might signal slightly differently, but we have seen that sometimes a wolf will play with a polar bear because before they started, you know, to eat each other, they signal that there is going to be a play that will go on. So we're not going to bite, we're not going to, you know, attack. And in animals, play means learning. And with humans, it is not so different. In fact, I would say that from the very early age, we understand gamification well. Think back to the time when your mother perhaps, um, 
you might not remember it, but maybe if you have a younger sibling, uh, maybe she was trying to feed vegetables to a younger brother, and now you're observing it. I'm a father, so I've observed a lot of these skillful teaching techniques <laughs> that my wife does. And so the child does not want to eat it. So what does the mother do? Well, she's going to create a gamified environment. Here's an airplane, right? Here's an airplane. Open your mouth, and the child buys into it, right? So the other thing, in addition to motivating to learning, to facilitating learning, play also helps us to make people do things that otherwise they don't want to do. In gaming, we call it grunt work. Uh, if you play Minecraft, you know that you have to dig really long holes to find anything. Uh, worse, if you're playing War of uh, Warcraft, thank you for coming out uh, from your room. Uh, but, but you know how, how, you know how uh, much time it takes to go through this grunt work. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have students do the classroom grunt work, practicing math or pra practicing programming, whatever it is, and have that drive like kids do when they sneak out in the middle of the night to play, right? Even though they're going to be punished for it. So let's look at some theories that perhaps touch on why that happens. Uh, one more thing I want to mention, though, is that uh, as much as I enjoy playing video games, I want to make a distinction between uh, video games and the gamification that we are going to talk about. We will talk about Classroom as a game itself. Uh, for uh, many years, uh, people were trying to revolutionize uh, education. And so every other thing that, that happens is going to revolutionize education. Uh, television was going to revolutionize education. Radio before that. Um, later, light board, right? All, or smart board. All those things. It takes us back to Socrates, who basically felt that the technology of their time was going to ruin people. And we do have you know, people on both ends, like online learning is great or it's going to completely destroy the world. So Socrates basically was saying that the technology of their time was going to destroy the mind and people are going to get dumber. And he was talking about writing, right? So as we see throughout the time, innovation and technology doesn't completely change things, but it teaches us that really teaching is about the person-to-person -person interaction. And it's about finding a way to motivate people. So as much as we are into technology, we remember that it is uh, learning about people. And what we'll talk about today, what motivates people, which will make us successful as teachers. So let's talk about peer instruction for a second. Uh, let me show you how you can find notes for this presentation. I have, I have a PowerPoint. All right. I personally don't like PowerPoint. I believe there's something called death by PowerPoint. And if you've ever been to a sales meeting, you know what I'm talking about. But I have, a, I have a slide, and on this slide there is a uh, link. It's bit.ly slash UICGG. And GG, of course, stands for, for good game. Uh, but this link is going to take you to uh, a YouTube video that uh, is also available if you uh, visit my uh, Twitter account, where um, I tweeted a little bit about the conference and uh, attended a great presentation by Elizabeth on uh, uh, the Retention Center. But there is a link to this video uh, where I basically am talking about how students, all right, how students can use gamification if the faculty refuse to. Because you see, the power of gamification is really for the benefit of the students. And so they can do that all by themselves. And in the About section, I have all the notes that, uh, that I need to, uh, to talk to you. So first of all, let's talk about a little bit of uh, research that is done on peer instruction uh, or, or active learning. There is a, a beautiful article here, uh, a research paper that talks about uh, why active learning is far better than traditional instruction. Now, traditional instruction we would understand as lecturing, basically. So, if you uh, review this uh, just uh, uh, briefly, it talks about uh, traditional lecture being one and a half times more likely to fail uh, than where students in classes are with active learning. Uh, and also there is a, a comment here about, um, right here, the student performance on examinations and concept um, inventories increased by half of st standard deviation. So what we're saying is that using things like Poll Everywhere in the classroom, putting this game controller in the hands of students, wakes them up, and it helps them to remember things. Half of standard deviation, they're talking about uh, basically a half of a grade forward. 
So we have a technology for this already. It's not that hard to implement because what we did earlier on, the word cloud, right? You just ask folks to answer a simple question. Uh, later on, I'll show you a few, a few tricks around it. It's not difficult to implement. But really, teaching uh, can change students' grades. Sometimes we might feel like in this interactive course, there are hundreds, maybe hundreds of people, and their background, what they came with from high school, is going to make a big difference. Uh, perhaps their aptitude towards the subject. For years now, we had research uh, dating back to the 80s. And uh, this research is done by, uh, was done by Dr. Bloom. Um, and so in this research, he talks about a two sigma problem. So not just half of standard deviation, he has the solution for increasing students' grades by two standard deviations. Now, for anybody that has statistics a long time ago, we're talking about the normal distribution, and then through the middle, we have uh, a division, and there are four uh, paths to move from uh, between standard deviations. So what is it that he's talking about? How can you increase grades that much? Well, that's tutoring. You see, that's when we have as many faculty as we have students. And when you talk face-to-face -face with a student, you can make a lot of people successful. Now, we can't expect universities to have that many faculty. So those are the realities. So what can we do to create this level of personalization? One more paragraph from this um, research, which is on uh, page 11 here, uh, which I just uh, enjoy reading over and over again. Let me uh, navigate to it. It's the paragraph uh, uh, that, that I will read here. Teachers are frequently unaware of the fact that they are providing more favorable conditions of learning for some students than they are for other students. Generally, they are under the impression that all students in their classes are given equality of opportunity for learning. One basic assumption of our work on teaching is the belief that when teachers are helped to secure a more accurate picture of their own teaching methods and styles of interaction with their students, they will increasingly be able to provide more favorable learning conditions for more of their students rather than just for the top fraction of the class. So now we're talking about faculty who lecture, who feel they, they're doing a great job. In fact, their evaluations might come in as really, really good because students are happy that they got through the class. Mm -hmm. And we continue with that first uh, sentence there, the teachers are frequently simply unaware. So how can we uh, take some lessons on that? Well, just a moment, uh, we'll get to that. Let's look at uh, this research which was done by Microsoft. In Canada, they, uh, uh, they did a little bit of research on attention spans, and uh, they came up to this finding that in 2000, the research span was 12 seconds, and it's about 8 seconds in 2013. Now, YouTube became really successful because they limited the video to five minutes. And that was pretty much the attention span at the time. You know, we could watch a video for five minutes. Um, today, when students are sitting in the classroom, they are not trained, they don't have the experience to have the focus that we would expect them to have. And so you are all in academic circles, so you can sit for an hour and listen to someone, okay? But that is not the case with our audiences today. So this is where the need for peer instruction is to get the game controllers in the hands of students. Now let's move to uh, a second section, and that is once we know that we can at least do active learning in the classroom, which brings in, brings in some gamification principles, let's talk about what motivates people in general. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, these references here. So in the 50s, there was research done uh, by John Atkinson and he came, came up with a theory called uh, value expectancy or expectancy value. And according to uh, his research, the reason why people are excited about a job or why people are motivated to in a classroom is because before they got there, they knew they were good at the subject matter and they saw value from pursuing it. So if in high school you've taken some courses and you've gotten good grades and now you feel that computers will give you a good job, your interest in this interactive course will be quite high. Now, on the other hand, uh, what if you did not take any courses in computer science? In fact, your major is business, and you know you will never do programming in your life after school. 
your interest in this class and your motivation in this class will be quite low. So that's the, the first theory that, uh, uh, that we start with. The second one is by uh, uh, Edward uh, Desi and Richard Ryan, and they are talking about self-determination theory here. In this theory, there are three basic words that cover the concepts uh, of motivation. The first one is relatedness. So if we can relate to the subject matter, or if we can have relationships as part of the subject matter, uh, if, we, uh, if we can show that we care about someone, that takes care of this motivational part of relatedness. The other part is autonomy. So what they found is that when people uh, have choices given to them, it could be as simple as letting the students choose the subject matter for the project. If, if students have choices, they will be more motivated to, to pursue this class. Uh, and then the last one, uh, they are talking about uh, uh, mastery. So, I'm sorry, it's called competence. They call it competence. So competence means that as I started this class, I didn't know a lot, but now I can trace back the things that I have learned. I see my progress. Now later, and it's this third reference, uh, Daniel Pink uh, wrote a, a book, which is really a business book, called The Drive, and he renames these a little bit. Uh, instead of calling it relatedness, he calls it uh, purpose. So now businesses would like to keep their employees motivated at work just like we do in the classroom for students. And so what businesses are looking to do is to increase this relatedness factor or the purpose. And we have companies that sell shoes and they will give a, a pair of shoes to Africa or you know, another uh, place as you are buying a pair of shoes for yourself. And so now the employees feel greater purpose and then relatedness. Uh, autonomy, uh, so Daniel Pink agrees here on the word autonomy and that is if someone stands over your shoulder and tells you what to do every step of the way, that job is not going to satisfy you for very long and you are likely to be demotivated and when opportunity uh, arises you're going to leave. And the third thing that Daniel Pink uh, says here is purpose. So, um, I'm sorry, there was purpose, autonomy and mastery. So, Desi and Ryan call it uh, competence, he calls it mastery. Perhaps better applying it to business. So, in the business environment, mastery means first of all, do I have opportunities for growth? You see, if you're in a job where the task you're performing will be ever that you will be doing, it's difficult for our intrinsic motivation to get behind that. But if there are growth opportunities, if you are learning more, so you're increasing mastery, you're going to stay there. If this is in the classroom, can you trace the progress of your learning and do you feel like you're learning something, like, like you're upgrading your skills? Now that's difficult to do in the classroom because we have so many people coming in with different skills. How can you increase everybody's skills? And this is where research by uh, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi comes in from the University of Chicago who talks about the state of flow. And the, the flow is when the tasks in the classroom are between boredom and anxiety. And unfortunately, for a large classroom, there isn't a single path to do this with. So what I'm proposing is that by creating a game type classroom, we are first of all going to make a number of tasks optional. And when we do that, we allow students to take various paths through the course to keep each one in that flow zone between anxious and bored. And so for some students, it means that these optional tasks will be very difficult. For other students, it means that these tasks may be remedial. They may be practi practicing more of the time. So that's the, the research on motivation that we are um, uh, operating in this uh, short uh, literature review. And now let's talk about some of the uh, options that we have for implementing this in the class. The number one principle that uh, we have to realize in the class is that classes initially were created very much like games because there are artificial rules that we follow in the class. We have uh, tasks that are basically uh, artificial. We have certain objectives. And we even have a code of conduct, just like we have fair play in games, right? The one big difference is that the score in the class is called the grade. And that's quite different than the score in the game. You see, when you play a game and you get a score, it really shouldn't matter whether you won or lost, right? You played a good game, you're happy with that. Two people play chess, at the end they'll congratulate each other, it was a good game. 
the stakes of a grade are tremendous. So the score of the classroom game is simply the stakes are too high. Someone might have to leave the university. Someone might, might lose their scholarship. So that's how the game of class has changed for the worse. It's a bad design. What I'm proposing is that you introduce in your class a different scoring system. You still keep the grades, all right? I'm not a re revolutionary, all right? I don't want to be carried away from campus. So we will still keep the grades, but the grades will be like natural milestones. In my classroom, I introduce experience points. And what the experience points do for me is they allow me to give students a score that's completely unrelated to their grade. So this is where we now have the autonomy. Now, students don't have to play the game at all, but those who choose to play, and most of them do, will have benefits. Now, it is not going to be directly translated to a grade. So the game that they play will have experience points, you will have certain privileges in the class, but it is not directly related to a grade. So let me show you how I do this uh, momentarily here. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, bring up uh, uh, an interface from, uh, from this game. All right, so this is what, uh, we'll make that small, we'll make it look like a phone. So uh, this is a, a, actually part of a mobile app. And uh, as part of, uh, of the app, students have opportunity to uh, have an avatar. Now there's a system out there called Gravatar where uh, just having an email address gives you a picture and then they can then update it to something of their own. And one of the uh, game principles is to provide this alternate personality, the opportunity for students to have a clean start and to play the game through someone else. So they can actually call their avatar something. In this particular game, um, I believe I am a Batman, so um, you can basically take on a new identity. And uh, then you score points as you go through the game. Now let me show you uh, some examples of uh, what some of the missions in this game are. First of all, uh, I, I give a mission early on in the semester for students to go through the course syllabus. And uh, in the course syllabus, there's some kind of a little thing that I have them look for. And when they find it, they can claim this game code. Now, the mechanics of the actual game are very simple in that, uh, let me change this here. The mechanics are very simple in that every mission is going to result in some kind of a code. And then simply once you find the code, you're going to come to this screen and type it in. And that's how you get the points, right? So it's a very simple mechanics of the game. It's, it's important in games to make it just complicated enough that, are, that people are willing to play but not, you know, have them read the whole pamphlet before they can get started. Think about uh, maybe some sports games that we have, right? How difficult would it be to get students to run around the field and exercise for an hour, but you create simple rules, you put a ball in the middle, and they'll play for many hours and enjoy it, right? So the rules have to be simple. In this instance, you go through a mission, I send you on some kind of uh, uh, objective, and you're going to co uh, collect a code. So I can hide the code in my syllabus. I can also give out the code in the classroom. So during the first day, I'll write down the code on the board and they can immediately get started and collect uh, the experience points. Uh, there are, in, in the gamification principles, there are uh, a number of personalities of gamers. And uh, one of the um, pools of these personalities, um, developed or defined by Dr. Bartle, uh, talks about four personalities. The first one being explorer. And so you can see how in games, some people are motivated just by finding new things and looking at them. Uh, the other one would be achiever. So someone uh, is going to be there just to collect the points. You give them points and they'll be there for you. In fact, uh, the other day I had a student who had an opportunity to uh, influence their grade with game points and did not want to do that. They wanted to keep the points. All right, so there is an achiever personality where I'll do everything I can to be on top of this uh, leaderboard. The third uh, personality type, uh, so we have uh, explorer, achiever, we have an influencer. Uh, sometimes influencer will be called a killer. So an influencer basically is trying to uh, change people's minds or make an impact 
get, get some kind of a, a reaction. And the last one is socializer. Where building relationships is important, if the game allows me to help someone, that's what will motivate me. Now, these personalities can overlap. People have you know, multiple uh, motivating factors. But in this particular game, one thing that I do uh, right from the beginning is I, I give them the first way of using points. And that is, if you have a late, late assignment, and in this class there are 49 uh, graded assignments, and everybody gets a late assignment once in a while. So if you have a late assignment, I'm not going to listen to the excuses because, you know, I, I really feel bad because I think the people who really are honest, you know, they sort of sound dumb because I just forgot or, you know, I thought there was nothing due. And then people who are really creative, you know, they get out with, with, with so I don't want to hear them. Instead, <laughs> what you will do is, if you have enough experience points in the game, I'm going to let you use those points to make up a late assignment. Now, it's not going to be as simple as just working with me. In fact, first thing you have to do is you have to find someone who already took my class ahead of time. You have to ask them to recommend you. And then when you say, I want to make up a late assignment, there's a request that will go to them. They will approve it, and then we make an arrangement. So this mission here for class alumni recommendation, that's the socializing element. You see, I create automatically a relationship with someone who took the class, perhaps someone who can give them, uh, you know, some feedback on why missing assignments is a bad thing. Uh, and then, you know, the more assignments they miss, there might be other conversations that will, that will take place. Later on in the class, I build on this principle, and that is students who have more than 500 points, they actually can become uh, a recommending player. So now within the class, you can find someone who's playing the game well, and they can recommend you, and to create a conversation, I will also give points to the person that's recommending you if you complete assignments. Right. So the way it works, there might be conference conversation like this. You know, we're sitting next to each other, and uh, you know, we're saying, "Hi, you know, hi, my good friend. Uh, what's your name, by the way? Oh yeah. Uh, so, uh, how are your assignments? Did, did you miss any late assignments? Because I'd be happy to recommend you. You know, how about if you complete those late assignments? So now you can create an environment, you see, where the game supports the goals of the class, and uh, I think that's part of uh, uh, the gamification is that that you suddenly have all these tools that otherwise you would not have. So some of the other uh, missions here uh, would include, um, uh, let me just look at this, um, what I call peace of mind points. So before I can get to peace of mind points, uh, let's talk about something that games do that courses do not, and that is games support failure. Okay, courses are anti-failure, and failure is how we learn. Okay, so imagine in the course, perhaps you're grading an essay, and someone, you explain how to do it, someone's turning it in, and uh, you're going to give them feedback. Well, they'll get a grade, and then you'll move to the next assignment. See, how many times can they resubmit this assignment? How many times do you let them fail, and that's not going to influence their grade? Right? That's not how courses work. So failure, unfortunately, is what our Western culture is, is uh, playing as a bad thing. Right? Success is what we emphasize. And yet, we learn more from failure. So, uh, um, some, in some disciplines, in computer science, uh, for example, uh, I partner with Cengage, which is a textbook uh, publisher. And they allow uh, this program uh, to be in the browser where students go in to click on Microsoft Excel or Access, and they can fail many times before they accomplish uh, the goal. And as they fail, I am able to track that and give them experience points for doing additional assignments which are not graded in the class. So this is how the experience points now support the idea of failing because the more assignments they do, the more they fail, and that's optional, right? So everybody that doesn't feel the need for it, they don't have to do that. But think for a moment how you might support failure in your class, or if you're a student, how could your instructor do that? And I want to give you just two, two minutes to think about it. And uh, I'd like to collect your thoughts on that. So um, uh, we're going to re-navigate to uh, a different poll and think about how you could support failure in a class. So how can you create an environment where a student passes with an A, but they did that 
through many, many attempts and many failing uh, trials. Uh, so let me uh, bring up here. Uh, this time uh, in Poll Everywhere, we're going to look at, um, at a system called uh, brainstorming. All right. And so what I'd like you to do is in two or three words, uh, express how you can support failure. And so we're going to collect this on the screen momentarily. There are trolls behind the scenes. One of the things that, that I do in the class is halfway through the semester, when you know that the attendance is going to drop, I tell students that uh, trolls have been you know, spotted on campus. And if you're not in the class, uh, then the trolls are after your experience points. And uh, in order to pre protect from the trolls, you have to have this game code. And I put it, you know, I, I put it on the board for the day. So every, not every time, because in gamification you don't want to do something regularly. You want to have this unpredictability. But once in a while, I give a code, and everybody that doesn't have that code is going to have a number of experience points removed. So that's, that's what the trolls are doing. And uh, for whatever reason, uh, the trolls are after my um, poll everywhere here. All right, so we'll, we'll do this. We'll clear this up. All right, so go ahead and na navigate to this URL and tell us how you could support uh, this idea of failure to promote learning in the classroom. All right, you might have to refresh the screen if I'm not sure if um, the browser is working as expected. So while you're doing that, uh, I want to mention three elements that uh, apply in our gamified classrooms. One is providing failure environments, right? So whereas before we are focused on instruction and assessment, failure is where learning takes place. The second part is to provide clear goals. And this is really instruction, instructional design. And so we knew for a while that if the class is uh, instructed or designed well, then uh, students do better. So clear goals, failure, and the third one is feedback. In the game, the moment you start moving a character, you get points and you get the feedback, you get the path, you get that mastery where you see where you came from and where you're going. There are more gamification principles, but let's focus on those. And what you'll notice now on the app that uh, now that you see what other people are doing, you can upvote them as well. So now look at this list and see if there are any of these that uh, you would like to agree with and you can upvote them. All right, so we have some that are bubbling to the top like retrying quizzes. Uh, peer mentoring, so this would support the Bloom's research on one-on-one -on -one tutoring, multiple attempts, additional assignments, experience points. All right, and here are some auto-corrected quizzes. I like that. It's just, this is very much like a game, isn't it? You fail the first time. So now it's time to correct. You fail a second time, third time, and it could be different for everybody, which is how we create that flow between boredom and anxiety that Mihai Csikszentmihalyi uh, was talking about. So looking down the list, uh, uh, points for going to the office hours, I like that. Um, ask for first drafts of assignment, excellent. Um, eye clickers, sure, so various ways of in introducing uh, active uh, learning in the classroom. So. Thank you for, for this uh, feedback and uh, uh, obviously we all want to give thought on how to help students fail, which is sort of the opposite of what we've been doing, right? Because we tell students, uh, if you put your mind to it, you can be anything you want, right? I'm five foot six and I'd like to be an NBA player, right? And so how hard do I have to work to accomplish that? But instead, if I can fail, the right amount, I can learn at least what I'm good at. And so what an adjustment. And that's what games are teaching us. So if you consider 
First of all, the feedback area. Do you grade midterms? Do you grade assignments quickly enough so students can learn from that? Uh, within feedback, my experience point idea where we are going to provide uh, certification for failure. So students who have to do a lot of extra work to, to get to the level of the class, before they could do that, but because no one recognized it, they weren't doing it. So just the experience points help with that. Uh, uh, then we have uh, the idea of uh, the clear goals and, uh, and uh, the failure. Are there any questions uh, from, from the audience? All right, uh, please go ahead. And you said you, um, most of your students actually play the game, so to speak. Uh, what happens with those others who do not? Um, are there, uh, is there something else for them to do or do they you just, is it okay? I appreciate the question. So. We often are concerned about students perhaps who don't have mobile devices or students who are so busy with their work that they just don't have time for extra things. Uh, so, you know, my point with that would be if they don't have time for learning, right, and they're in the class to pass it, so that is just their mode of operation. But I, I think the, the, the important part about this is this, this entire game system is a wrapper to a regular course. So the regular course operates on assignments that are graded, assigned, instructed, and then, and then assessed. So what I'm doing here with this game is a gamification system that can fit on any existing class of any subject, really, because if the mission is a computer topic or if the mission is some kind of a chemistry research, this would all fit. And I make it completely optional. So I don't know of any students who don't play the game, but there might be. So I don't track it, uh, but I can show you um, uh, this semester's uh, leaderboard. And, um, and here it is. So, uh, so the way I've designed the leaderboard is I, I don't show all the players. I just show, um, uh, well, how many? About 18 players around you, so that's me. And then if you want to, you can see the, the, the top 30 players. Um, that way, we're not discouraging people, uh, especially gender-wise. Uh, what happens is when uh, you are on top of the list, you feel bad for other people being lower than you. So even the design of the leaderboard is, is uh, based on principles. But if I recall correctly, there is a way to, to hack it and to actually see everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and so here is a list of uh, everybody in this class. And I have about 150 students this semester, which pretty much aligns with how many I would expect. Um, now, I couldn't say, um, I couldn't say that um, Everybody is, uh, you know, as diligent as the top ten, right? But everybody sees some benefits in the game because of the benefits that experience points bring. And so, for some, it's late assignments. For some, it would be uh, fewer uh, questions on the exams. So, if if I give additional quizzes, maybe another hundred questions to answer, uh, you can earn experience points through that. And therefore, I'm okay if you have fewer questions on, on, on the midterm, perhaps. So uh, the experience points create an environment where I can incentivize the various personality types. Thank you. Any other questions? Please. How long does it take to build all of this? So I do it in my spare time. <laughs> uh, but there is, so the, the main delivery of this is a mobile app. And uh, students simply put in their email, then they, then they verify that in the email mailbox, so I don't use any passwords. Um, and um, you can preview this app, it's called CIS 150, and uh, the app is in, in the um, Apple store as well as on an Android, and you'll be able to actually get on, on the game. Uh, I enjoy doing it, so the reason why I am all excited about gamification is because um, I'm a programmer by nature. And so what I found is that when you learn programming, it's like playing a game throughout the class. Because every module that you try to design is a little game, right? You, you eventually are successful, and, and you move on to the next one that's difficult, and then you're successful. And then as you're programming in professional projects, it's the same way. So it's not uncommon for me to look at the watch and it's three in the morning, because I've been having you know, all that fun working. Now, I usually don't share that with people, because then, you know, uh, People uh, feel like um, work is so much fun, so just you know, just do it. 
Um, but I think that is where Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's idea of the flow goes from school to employment. Because if you can create this idea of flow and of being uh, wired into a, a, an activity, that really what is going to help you get more out of life because now your eight hours at work is not just time that you regret, right? And now you have some money to live on the, during the weekend, but you actually are enjoying every minute of it. So let me uh, 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 show a couple of more screens here from, uh, from uh, the game itself. Uh, let me resize this, there we go. So the, the profile itself allows for placement of achievements. So as students complete specific missions, they will unlock new uh, functionality. Uh, so at the top we have the mentorship of elite assignments. That means that you found someone to recommend you. Uh, this really helps me to keep in touch with the alumni from the class and it uh, helps to, to create um, a learning community. Then uh, the uh, Peace of Minds points are only unlocked if you uh, completed um, the specific number of additional quizzes. And so this is part of preparation for, um, uh, for the exams. And then uh, I can of course add achievements as, as, we go, uh, as we go. Now if you're looking for little things that you can implement in your class right now, I would recommend this website called uh, QuizUp. Now QuizUp happens to be also a mobile app, and what QuizUp allows you to do is you can load your own questions. So think about maybe helping your students to prepare for a midterm or final exam. If there are multiple choice questions, you can create them in QuizUp, and now students are going to play against each other and, 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 and score points. This is the one activity in the class that I don't give them experience points for. Because I feel that this is so much fun all on its own and it's using the right principles that I don't have to reward them for it. And they do. So what this allows me to do then is to have students prepare for the midterm, have fun while doing that, which means that they might be doing history first, then they do a little quiz up to relax, and then they do something else that's boring, right? <laughs> uh, but this is free. You can, you can just create your own subject matter and um, many of your students will already be familiar with it because uh, QuizUp has subject for the um, Game of Thrones and you know everything else that you can think of. Uh, but if there's nothing else that you want to implement in your own class, I think QuizUp is, uh, is at least one. So thank you very much for your attendance uh, and I'm uh, uh, happy to answer any questions afterwards. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and, and ask questions and uh, enjoy the rest of the day.